Good morning and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. As part of your knowledge series today, we'll be discussing a very important theme, which is Vedic period. As you know, Vedic period is generally important because it becomes a part of culture in a way because of the Rig Vedic texts and the texts which are related to it. And over and above that, because of the fact that it is also an important topic for prelims and generally its features are important. So, what we are going to discuss right now is a very simple concept and we'll go in that structure itself. Basically, I will concentrate on the Rig Vedic period and we will concentrate on the political and economic. The two most plausible areas from which a question can come. Over and above that, we need to understand why is that the Rig Vedic period is so important in our history itself. And the importance comes out when you will understand where it is placed in the larger story of our history. So basically you have Paleolithic, Mesolithic, Neolithic, Chalco, Lithic in which we have Indus Valley Civilization as a part of it. So Indus Valley Civilization would be the last Chalcolithic Bronze Age Civilization. Thereafter, we go to what we call as the Vedic period. And the Vedic period we'll talk about is divided into two, but there's a basic importance of this period. Basically, why this is important is because all of this comes under what we call as prehistory. This comes as a part of prehistory, protohistory, both. And Vedic period is proper historical period or historical or history period. Why is that? Basically, during Paleolithic, Mesolithic, Neolithic, we only find what is called archaeological sources. On the other hand, for Chalcolithic, basically we have archaeological sources, but we start to find early writing in the IVC which is writing and some form of language. Unfortunately, we don't know what that language is. So we put it into prehistory, protohistory, both. Prehistory is the period in which you only reconstruct via archaeological sources. Protohistory is when early writing starts to develop. And the basic point is if, if and when we do decipher IVC, it will move out of protohistory and go into historical period. Basically, Vedic period is the first period in Indian history itself which is fully reconstructed based on texts, literature, and more than that, supplementing it with archaeological sources, whatever are available. So basically, Vedic period is the period which has been fully reconstructed based on the ideas of what we talk about or what is given in the Rig Veda and the other three, which is Samved, Yajurved, and Atharved. So basically, the Vedic period becomes important because of the fact that it is a period which is fully reconstructed based on textual knowledge, literary sources. Then comes the division within Vedic period itself. Vedic period is divided into two parts. One is called Early Vedic and the second one is called Later Vedic. This is 1500 to 1000 BC. And this is 1000 to 500, BC, 500 BCE. So basically 500 years here, 500 years here. And totally the Vedic period is actually 1500 to 500 BCE. But we divide it into two, which is early Vedic and later Vedic. And today we will technically concentrate on the early Vedic, which is 1500 to 1000 BCE. And basically called the early Vedic or the Rig Vedic period. And how do we divide this? We divide it because the early Vedic period is fully reconstructed based on the reading of the Rig Veda. So as you know, there are four Vedas. So only reading Rig Veda, you make the first period or what is called the early Vedic period. And the other three, Sam Veda, Yajur, Veda and Atharva Veda, 
these are read to reconstruct the later Vedic period. And later Vedic period in that regard is much more complex, is much more institutionalized and we'll talk about that maybe in a different video. Right now, we are concentrating on the early Vedic and its political and economic setup. And this is the basic point which we need to understand at this point of time, which is that how is that the Vedic period is so important in a larger story. It is important in a larger story because of the fact that you have prehistoric period, proto-historic period and the historical period which starts with Vedic period and we are still in the historical period itself. This historical period is inaugurated by the Vedic period itself, the development of four very important texts and their reading to create the history which is available to us. And this is why this text becomes very very important and this period becomes very very important. Now, this is the Rig Veda. This is the earliest specimen which we actually used. We found it only 150 years ago, which is that it was found in Kashmir. This is a page out of the manuscript of Rig Veda. This was made on a bridge bark and found in Kashmir. About 150 years ago, it was the first time that this text was found and the earliest text of Rig Veda was reconstructed on this and the English translation also and you can find it in Pune if you want to go there. In the Pune library you will find the copy of this. Basically this is the earliest, earliest specimen of Rig Veda and once we found this we then reconstructed and added a period which we call as 1500 to 1000 BC which we call as the Rig Vedic period. This is this time period has been given by a very important Indologist Max Muller. And Max Muller is the one who actually gave this period after reading. He is an Indologist linguist. So he was able to read it and understand it. And basically he gave us this basic period of 1500 to 1000. So first, why is it important? Prehistoric to protohistoric to historical. Then basically the concept of this text which is the Rig Veda itself being found 150 years ago and thereafter reconstructing, reading it, understanding it, what language it is, Sanskrit, then Brahmi script, everything was then understood. Now, let's then talk about political, let's then talk about political structure. What distinctly makes the Rig Veda period or what is called the early Vedic period, early Vedic. So the first and foremost thing is that you need to understand that the whole society was based on what is called nomadic pastoralist community. What do I mean by that? Nomadic pastoralist that these are, these are societies or the early Vedic people themselves were technically pastoralist. Nomadic means they move from place to place. So they are technically not, not fully sedentary. Sedentary means to be at one place and pastoralist means that they are based on cattle, sheep, goat rearing what we call as animal husbandry in a way, rudimentary animal husbandry. Basically, basically the Rig Vedic people, the early Vedic people were cattle rearers and pastoralism is the word which we used for them. So if their society is pastoralist, what happens is that their political organization shows an imprint of pastoralist nomadic communities and the basic imprint is that what they have is not full-fledged monarchy but what we call as chieftains or tribal polity. What I mean by that is that this tribal polity concept is that the chief that the chief is selected by the tribe and not specifically because he is of royal blood because of his either experience or his age. So he is either an elder 
or because he has a lot of experience, he is able to lead the tribe itself. So they have tribal polity, which is that chieftain. They do not have what we call as, do not have monarchical system. So there is no hereditary kingship, meaning that the son will not automatically become the king because the father was the king. And third, and the most important, no system of proper taxation. So that they are not taxing, they are not taxing everybody. And one more thing which is very interesting is, the people constitute the polity, meaning where the people go, the chief goes. So there is no concept of, no concept of territorial kingship, meaning they are technically not, not linked to territory. Basically what I mean to say is that the people constitute the polity, not the territory unlike what we have today, borders, it is not that. So basically, these four features give us an idea that it is a proper chieftain tribal based polity. Over and above that, we also see that the society or what we call as the political society is not based on give and take with the king, but his loyalty. It is about loyalty to the king. And they did fight wars, wars did happen, but they were not wars for territory, but for cattle. And I will talk about the words which are used, Janasya Gopa. Gopa means cattle. So it is about cattle, cattle raiding, meaning one tribe is fighting another tribe to get their cattle. So it is not that there is no warfare, there is warfare. Warfare is for cattle, not for territory. And this is why the Rig Vedic period becomes very interesting in that regard because there is pastoralist community, tribal polity, rudimentary agriculture as I will talk about, but cattle is the prized possession. Wealth is linked to cattle and this is a very important point. Once cattle is in your hand, you believe that you have what is called power. So let us read it out and it will also make sense. So, what is the polity? It is a chieftain structure. The administration was tribal in nature, no full fledged monarchical state. Every tribe was ruled by an elder called Pramukha or Jeshtha. He also took the title of Rajan. So here the word Rajan has a connotation of a village elder and he is not a Rajan in the sense of a monarchical king. Then. The tribal chief was also known as Janasya Gopa. Janasya Gopa means, Jana means people and Gopa means cattle. So the words such as Gopa and Gopati are lord of cattle, meaning it's about protecting the people and the cattle, which indicates that they were protecting and increasing their cattle herds. That was the major role which the Rajan said. So the Rajan's role was to protect the people and the cattle, unlike what will happen later where the territory will become important. So basically the word Janasya Gopa itself and this is how we have reconstructed the period which is by reading the Rig Veda itself very closely, Janasya Gopa, the word Rajan has a different connotation of itself. Then they waged wars totally as I told you but to protect cattle in Rig Veda there is one word which we see which is called Bali but it's a gift and gift giving tradition is quite common in tribal societies where the Rajan received some fruits, some cattle related products. The Rajan received it as a form of honor and respect from the members of the clan, but basically no system of taxation. Taxation does not exist, even currency obviously will not exist, it will only come into existence in Mahajanpada period and the king is not a divine king or king based on power, he is based on loyalty 
and respect. So the word Bali is the first word which you need to remember which has a connotation of being a gift, not anything more than that. Then, how is the whole political structure organized? Because you need to know this. Though it is chieftain or tribal polity, it had very, very distinctly defined levels of administration. So you need to understand one thing. It is not that monarchical states only have divisions. Even in Rig Vedic period, we have divisions and different bodies. And we have to discuss Sabha, Samiti and Vidhata. Basically, the largest unit, which is the people itself, were called Jana. That is why the word Janpad, Maha Janpad. Wherever the Pad, the feet of the Jana go, that is the Janpad. So, Jana. This is the basic word we find. Who leads the Jana? The Rajan. Rajan is the tribal chief. This is the biggest unit. So, the Jana. But then Jana is the biggest unit. How are these chief tribes organized? They are then organized into multiple Vish. And the wish is under the Vishapati, socio-administrative unit, meaning the, the king will not technically speak to the people, he will speak to the wish or Vishapati and that will be enough. Then under multiple wishes, we have what are called different grama and these gramas are nothing but technically rudimentary bands of people, can't call them a village but it's like 50-60 people together and one grama would then be further divided into kula or kulpati grihapati this is the household so this is nothing but the kula or griha or grihapati so basically it's a very elaborate structure in which you have the jana this is the basic political organization unit meaning these are the people who select the gramini and the Gramini then selects the Vishapati and the Vishapati then collects, select the Rajan. Basically, it's a system of gradationally going down into smaller units. So, Jana can be divided into Vish, which is under Vishapati, then can be divided further divided into Grama, Grama can then further be divided into Kula, Kula is nothing but household. Basically, basically, you can understand it, 10 households to the, together make one Grama. Then maybe 20 gramas will come together to make one wish and 50 wishes will make a jana. This is the way it is. So this is the way it is divided. But the most important institution during the Rig Vedic period are not this but the committees which are called the Sabha, Samithi and the Vidhata. Meaning the Rajan did not take decisions on himself or according to his wishes but by two committees Sabha and Samiti because Vidhata I'll tell you has a specific purpose. So what are the Sabha? The Sabha is the exclusive body of elders meaning it's a small elite gathering of tribal elders meaning all elders and important experienced members will come together will come together to help the Rajan. So the Sabha technically acts like a council of ministers that COM. It's a very exclusive body which is linked to the Rajan. And this is a very important point which you need to understand. It is that it is village elders. It is not based on, neither based on gender. It is neither based on anything else. It is based on what we call as experience and age. Then we have the Samiti. Samiti is like a general committee in which everybody is allowed, which is appears to have been a larger assembly of all tribal members presided by the Rajan. Meaning, this is the all tribal members. And in this, even women were allowed from time to time. So, it is not that women were not allowed. Tribal members, all members. So, this is like the whole clan takes a, a whole tribe takes a decision. So, it takes it via the Samiti. So, Samiti is a general body. It's like the, you can actually look at it like this. The Samiti would be like the UNGA, General Assembly, and the UNSC is like the Sabha, which is a, exclu a very exclusive body. Not everybody is part of it. It is based on experience. So, Sabha 
is a smaller body of elders. Samiti is a larger body of everybody. You will find in different books a different understandings. But as Arash Sharma would say, as we have studied, the women were allowed because if it says all tribal members, it means women also. So women were allowed into Samiti. You can quote me wherever you want to quote me, but it is technically true that women were allowed. You will find it different interpretation in different books. Don't go into that. Then comes the Vidhata. When we talk about the Vidhata itself, Vidhata is interesting. It is technically once a Samiti meets for a ceremonial purpose, it becomes a Vidhata. Basically, all members, when they meet for rituals or for ceremonies, it becomes a vidhata. As it says, tribal assembly with diverse functions refers to a local congregation of people meeting to perform socio-religious ritual ceremonies as for, a well, uh, as for the well-being of the settlement. Meaning, see, sabha is exclusive, only elders. Samiti is for everybody. But then, when the Samiti, which is everybody, meets for ritual purposes or reads for ceremonial purposes, it is called Vidhata. So the Vidhata technically is nothing but everybody meeting for rituals. So in a, in a small festival or in a small ritual for the well-being of the settlement, they meet it for Vidhata. So Vidhata can meet for different purposes. It is Samiti meeting for different purposes is Vidhata. So basically, Sabha should be clear, village elders, Samiti should be clear, which is everybody, it's a larger body. But once the Samiti meets for ritualistic purposes or the tribe meets, tribe meets for ritualistic purposes, it is called Vidhata. So Vidhata technically has no political functions. There's no political functions. While on the other hand, both are politically important. Politically important. So I hope now Sabha Samiti Vidhata is totally clear. Now, once this is done, the only thing which we need to understand now is economy. Economy, as I told you, is based on two basic concepts. One, that we have the most important occupation, which is pastoralism that you have cattle rearing as it is a society based on wealth of cattle, it is important. But there is also what is called rudimentary agriculture. And how do we know that? We know that because we find references to, references to plow, sowing, harvesting. So there are words which are referring to agriculture. But what we believe is that it was not the most important or the most ubiquitous form of occupation. There is rudimentary agriculture. We find VAP, we find different types of words which technically refer to agriculture. But agriculture has not fully become the larger context or the most important, most important uh, occupational activity. So two things which is pastoralism and rudimentary agriculture are the two things which mark the economy. No currency. Everything is based on barter and basically as there is no taxation, the concept is only based on gift exchange and community oriented. And why agriculture is not fully there is because these communities are moving around. They move. For agriculture you need sedentary life. For pastoralism, you need to move around. But basically, before I end this session, I would say that why is that agriculture was so important? Because when agriculture will become the most important occupational aspect, we will realize that agriculture will then introduce what is called a basic formula of how things will become more and more complex. Because what agriculture will do is make the people sedentary once they will become once they will become sedentary they will then start to produce surplus when there will be surplus there will be have and have nots when there will be have and have nots the society will become complex when the complex society will become complex 
it will technically lead to the need for state and with the need of state there is modern monarchy and what is called territorial state which will rise this is the what is called the this is the formula of neolithic revolution technically if agriculture is there people will become sedentary if there is sedentary it will lead to surplus formation surplus formation will create people with have and have not means some having less some having more that will in turn lead to complex society social stratification that will in turn lead to state formation one state formation will be there because they are sedentary it will become territorial state and this is technically the story of later vedic period later vedic period this is what is technically going to happen in the later vedic period between 1000 to 500 which will te technically lead to the formation of Mahajanpadas. This is the process which happens. So basically, early Vedic period is pastoralist, no taxation, no territorial state, basically based on tribal polity, Sabha, Samiti, Vidata, four levels of administration, and an economy which is in between, but basically pastoralist, that does not introduce complex social relations, simple social relations based on a egalitarian politics, Later, it will become more and more uh, complex once agriculture and iron will be used extensively. But this is, I think, enough to give you a very good understanding of what we call as Samasamiti Vidata, the basic tribal polity, and what we call as the early Vedic period. So with this, I'll take questions, but basically, more or less, oh, everything is sorted. Perfect. Okay, did the pastoralist move from place to place? Yes, they moved from place to place. That is pastoralism, cattle rearing. So basically, we can say that we can find the traces of early democracy in early Vedic period. Again, that would be a exaggeration. Yes, democratic democracy as a word technically would be an anachronistic proposition because democracy does not exist in Vedic period. As an idea, democracy only comes during 18th, 19th century. So it's it's what is called people's institutions, is it democracy? That would be a little bit far-fetched. So it's called anachronism in history. If you actually find some modern concept in the past, you are technically being anachronistic. But for the ba basic purposes of the exam, sure, why not democracy, early democracy, rudimentary democracy in some form is there, but that would be again far-fetched. Basically, that is an anachronistic proposition. That question itself is a problematic question. Okay, so Vedic period. Vedic period will technically have no paintings because Neolithic societies, which is pastoralist societies and uh, what is called the societies related to agriculture, don't have cave paintings because they are not in caves, they are in plain area. They have rudimentary agriculture, that is it. Yes, horses are there, sure, why not? Domestication of animals has already happened in the Mesolithic period. If there is no taxation, there cannot be any revenue collection. Uh, Samiti is an assembly where all common tribal people can participate. Yes, Samiti, everybody is allowed. Sabha, not everybody is allowed. So basically, basically you need to understand one thing is, this early Vedic period is like a uh, stepping stone for later Vedic and Mahajanpada phase. This period is important in that regard. Perfect. So thank you so much. I will see you next week with a very important set of topics, which is we'll be doing Quit India. We'll be talking about uh, a very important concept of Mauryan architecture. We'll be talk about basic pillar architecture. And we'll also go into the national movement where we'll talk about the partition of Bengal and Swadeshi. So for next week, we have Swadeshi and partition of Bengal along with Quit India, Quit India is on Monday, this Swadeshi and uh, Partition of Bengal is on Friday and on Tuesday we have a very important session on Mauryan architecture. So three sessions next, next week, this is for me this week, this is the fourth session, thank you so much. I will see you next week with these three topics and I hope that this is helping you. If you are finding the knowledge series helpful in any way or form, firstly, we would like to hear from you in the comment section about the appreciation about that and more than that, do like, share and subscribe to the sessions and to the YouTube channel itself. It helps us understand what you want, what we are doing is making sense. So thank you so much. See you on Monday with Quit India. Bye-bye.